Hi everyone, this is Dan Clanton, and this is our mini-lecture on the Catholic Reformation. First, let's talk about two new religious orders that originated during the period of the Catholic Reformation, and we'll begin by talking about Ignatius of Loyola. Born into a noble family, Ignatius had hopes of a military career until he received a serious leg wound in 1521 at the Siege of Pamplona. While convalescing, he read many devotional books, and following this, he decided to bring that same determination and discipline that characterized his military life to the life of monastic service. At first, he tried his hand in the Holy Land, but was asked to leave by the Franciscans. He then attended several universities in order to learn theology, and in 1534, he and six of his loyal companions made solemn vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience to the Pope. This new religious order was an attempt at creating a new organization that could respond to the needs of the times. At this early stage, the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, had as their mission the evangelization of Turks in the Holy Land. By the time Pope Paul III gave his official approval to the group in 1540, Protestantism was a much more imposing threat to the Church. As such, the Jesuits began their existence with two main goals, to mission to the heathen and to foster reform within the church. Due to their emphasis on education, as well as their paramilitary organization, the Jesuits quickly became the shock troops of the papacy. That is, they could be dispatched quickly to deal with a variety of pressing issues. A good example of the efficiency of Jesuit organization can be seen in their mission to China in the late 16th century, spearheaded in 1577 by the Jesuit Matteo Ricci. However, their enemies within and outside the church were numerous, and as a result, the Jesuits were expelled from Portugal in 1759. In 1764, they were expelled from France. In 1767, over 5,000 Jesuits were deported from Spain and expelled from all Spanish territories, including South America. In 1773, Clement XIV formally suppressed the society, and the Jesuits weren't officially recognized by the papacy again until Pius VII restored them in 1814. The second new religious order that arises during this period is the result of a remarkable woman named Teresa of Avila. Teresa was a Spanish nun of the Carmelite order when she began receiving religious visions in around 1555. After a long struggle with the meaning of her visions, as well as conflicts with her confessors and other church officials, she left the Carmelite order because she felt it was too lax. In 1562, she founded the convent of St. Joseph at Avila, where a more rigorous form of monastic rule was practiced. By 1567, she was founding monasteries for both men and women, thereby becoming the only woman in church history to do so. Her followers were known as the Discalcate Carmelites, because they wore sandals or went barefoot, that is, discalcate. Her mystical experiences deepened, and in 1572, she entered what she called a spiritual marriage with Christ. Her reforming yet arch-conservative influence on monasticism, as well as her teachings on mysticism, led Pope Paul IV to add her name to the list of the doctors of the church in 1970, an honor shared by only one other woman, Catherine of Siena. The Protestant Reformation was so influential that Catholics felt the need to respond in some way. Thus, those measures taken by the Catholics in response to the Protestant Reformations are, in a fit of scholarly creativity, usually called the Counter-Reformation. The highlight of these measures was the Council of Trent, which was held from 1545 to 1563. Even though this council is looked upon as a universal ecumenical meeting that set the tone for the church until the 20th century, we should remember that it only met sporadically and was poorly attended. Church historian Justo El Gonzalez notes that even though the council was convened in 1545 in the Italian town of Trent, it was moved to the Papal States soon after due to tensions between Pope Paul III 
and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. As a result, it was suspended in 1547, only to be reconvened briefly from 1551 to 1552. After Pope Paul IV became Pope in 1555, the Council didn't meet again until a new Pope, Pius IV, was in charge, and then it only met from 1562 to 1563. Also, there were only 21 prelates present in the first session, and only 213 in the last. Usually, church councils met to discuss one specific issue or doctrine, but because of the problems being caused by Protestantism, many doctrines were discussed and implemented at the Council of Trent. So let's take a look at some of the more important issues that were discussed at Trent. First of all, the Council of Trent reaffirmed the Nicene Creed. This is one of the earliest and most influential of the creeds in the Christian Church. It resulted from the Council of Nicaea in 325 and advocated what we call homoousios theology. Homoousios is a word that was coined by the Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, to describe the relationship between Jesus and God. Athanasius claimed that these two, the Father and the Son, were homoousios, that is, of the same substance. The reason it's important for the Council of Trent to reaffirm the Nicene Creed is to make their Christological presuppositions as transparent as possible. Secondly, in an obvious response to the thought of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent upheld the sole authority of the Church to interpret Scripture. In our mini-lecture on Martin Luther, we talked about three aspects of his thought to which the Council of Trent is probably responding. First of all, Luther's idea of sola scriptura, that is, Bible alone, Scripture alone. Luther thought, and you can see this in his ideas of the hiddenness of God and the priesthood of all believers, that there were only two places where one could encounter God or learn theologically important knowledge of God, that is, the Bible and Jesus. Furthermore, Luther felt that anyone who could read and interpret the Bible could be considered a priest. All of these ideas of Luther had devastating consequences for the ecclesiastical monopoly that the Catholic Church had on Scripture. So the Council of Trent felt it necessary to uphold the sole authority of the Church to interpret Scripture. Third, the Council of Trent upheld the idea of original sin as well as redefined the theological category of justification. Now the idea of original sin is nothing new, as we saw in our mini-lecture on Augustine. It's a fairly antiquated idea but it seems to contradict the Church's insistence on good works and penance playing a role in salvation. After all, if we're all writhing in sin, how are we able to do any good works? As you might have guessed, the Council's view on this issue is again a direct response to the ideas of Martin Luther. You see, Luther felt that original sin was so pervasive that it had destroyed our free will, so that only God's grace could enable faith which would then spawn good works. The Council of Trent claimed that even though free will had been handicapped by original sin, it certainly wasn't extinguished. Also, Luther had argued that justification is solely an act of God, a gift to a completely undeserving humanity. In their work, William Plater and Derek Nelson write that, quote, the bishops at Trent believed that salvation cannot be achieved without grace, but they rejected Luther's claim that justification comes from grace alone. Human efforts matter too. Luther had focused on an instant of justification, but Trent pictured justification as a process in which divine grace and human efforts cooperate at every step and not only lead God to count us as justified, but also begin to transform us so that we more nearly deserve that status. 
Fourth, the Council of Trent confirmed the Eucharistic theology of transubstantiation. This again is in opposition to Luther's view of consubstantiation. Fifth, the Council of Trent affirmed an official Catholic canon, and that canon can be found in Jerome's 4th century translation of the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate. Also, taking a cue from Luther's view of canon, which again we discussed in our mini-lecture on Luther, the Council created a list of works that correspond almost exactly to the Protestant Apocrypha, but the Council of Trent designates these works as deuterocanonical works. That's a fancy Greek word that means second canon. Sixth, the Council of Trent claimed that Catholic tradition is co-equal with Scripture. Again, in response to Luther's claim of sola scriptura, that is, Scripture alone, the Council of Trent wants to make sure that in any decision-making process, that Catholic tradition is on the same level in terms of authority as Scripture. Seventh, the Council of Trent reaffirmed the seven sacraments, that is, baptism, extreme unction, confirmation, marriage, penance, Eucharist, and holy orders. Eighth, the Council of Trent affirmed and regulated the use of relics, sacred images, and the veneration of saints. Ninth and finally, the Council of Trent corrected many abuses of the medieval church. For example, it condemned absenteeism and pluralism. That is, if you are a bishop, then you do have to live where you work. Uh, you cannot practice absenteeism. You cannot hold more than one position, pluralism. The Council also put in place educational regulations for ordination, including a heavy emphasis in terms of curriculum that privileged the work of Thomas Aquinas. In conclusion, the Council of Trent helped to prepare the Church for the early modern era by addressing so many theological issues and practical matters. Even so, it was obvious that the Church would never again enjoy the primacy of place and influence it had attained in the Middle Ages and the early modern era. Going forward, the Church would be challenged not only by Protestantism, but also by internal issues, such as the challenge of missions, but also by external problems, such as the rise of Islam under the Ottoman Empire. The Church would have to wait until 1869, when the first Vatican Council was convened, to undergo another systematic period of reform. This has been our mini-lecture on the Catholic Reformation. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to your feedback.